Hi, this is Steven from Neon Dagger, and this is going to be just a really quick getting started tutorial to help you get up to speed with Variabullet as quickly as possible. This will follow much of the documentation that uh, you'll find on the website and in the uh, PDF guides that come with Variabullet. If you uh, want more in-depth guides on how to come to grips with Variabullet, I'd highly recommend going to uh, the, either the website with the link below or check out the PDF documents that are included. All right, so when you first get variable it, when you first import it, uh, you're going to want to import it into a fresh project. I mean, you can put it into a, an existing project, but for several reasons, it's probably best to come to understand it first in a, in a fresh project. Uh, one of the main reasons why is because there are reserved layers, sorting layers and physics layers that variable it depends on, and your existing projects might... I mean, they will have different layers. They're not going to have these reserved layers. So there's a way of incorporating uh, manually these layers into your existing projects. But again, it's easier to, to get started with just a fresh start. And as a matter of fact, there is a very easy way to set up these layers. So basically, there's these two procedures here. tag uh, Replace Tag Manager, replace Physics 2D settings. Um, it'll back up the existing settings and overwrite with the uh, variable it layers and settings. So basically it's as simple as this to get the uh, layers set up. Just click that, let it do its thing, it'll back it up. It'll give you either a success or an error message. If you get an error message, you're probably going to want to check out the manual documentation, but that shouldn't be the case if you're starting from scratch in a fresh project. Alright, so these layers are now set up. They both were successful. You have the messages here just to confirm. So basically what we're going to really want to do is just you know, the workflow of setting up emitters and how that workflow typically goes. So we'll start off, just for demonstration's sake, we'll go to the sandbox here, which is just basically a preset. You have the uh, controller, actually, is what I call it. Uh, this controls the emitters. Here we have one, this green arrow, one emitter. And we have a player with a little sprite render here with this robot-like character, right? Well, so anyways, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to add this controller slash emitter. I'm going to delete the existing one, change this sprite to a ship, so I can show you vertical and horizontal orientation a little bit better. I'll choose this one, and right off the bat, I'll just mention that variable it assumes a left-to-right horizontal orientation course your game doesn't necessarily have to follow this and you know it's just a starting point and you can determine quite easily other orientations I'll show you that so here we have our ship sprite and and adding emitters is as easy as dragging the controller onto the ship so you'll find it in the ND variable it prefabs folder you go to controller and it'll show here the prefab marked as origin so I'll click and drag it there onto this ship, and you see there's a green arrow that's kind of overlaid over top of the ship right now. And that's because the origin point, which sort of serves as the anchor point, where the emitter, or collection of emitters, uh, sits relative to the uh, parent object, in this case the ship. So right here, it sits right in the middle, as you see here. Zero on the X and Y axis. So here in the controller script, underneath the origin game object. Uh, right off the bat, you can determine whether or not you want to orient on the tip. Center point goes to the center of the ship. and Or manual, where you can kind of determine, go to the origin. Now you can determine where exactly, you know, if you need to do some particular adjustment there. Probably want to default the tip. It's the easiest way to do things. So we have this one emitter with a point game object. We'll talk more about the point game object, which really is the part that fires and instantiates bullets or any sort of projectile. And the controller is basically about setting the emitters. So going back to the game view here, the first thing you'll do is, you know, you'll just want to add more emitters. So let's just say whatever, 12. And you see you, you add more, you add less, and it becomes cache. You can clear the cache here. Just a little note there. So I'm going to add 10 emitters, but you don't see them because they're overlaid on top of each other. And the uh, default pattern is radial. I'll just, I'll just show you. This is what happens when you change the spread via spread degrees, right? And you see it kind of, kind of doesn't anchor itself horizontally. So in order to anchor itself, just 
hit auto center and there you go. Now it creates a nice radial pattern that's anchored to the, to the tip. Uh, but now you may want to change the radius. So you can just change the radius by increasing or decreasing it accordingly. Or here's a handy little quick function. It auto sets it to the radius of the, uh, the parent sprite. So in which case, this doesn't quite make sense here why we'd want to do that. Usually, if you got it uh, set to center, you'll see now that's when it's auto set to the radius of the sprite, it just kind of the radius follows that of the sprite. Uh, if you have it set to tip instead of center, uh, you're going to probably want to hit auto comp radius, which keeps everything to the front. Just do four emitters. I'll clear that cache. And see now I can adjust the pitch. And now with spread degrees, I can do that. And I'm going to put it to five. When you have a, an odd number of emitters, it always keeps one in the middle, like that. So yeah, that's kind of handy. So that's the gist of a um, radial type of emitter formation. The other main one is stack formation, which also allows you to do um, radial type formations, although maybe not in some cases quite as dynamically. Uh, but it also allows you to adjust the center rotation independently of auto center, because now what auto center does is it keeps it vertically centered. So I'm going to keep it centered for pointing forward with just putting center rotation to zero and I'm going to change the pitch here, spread degrees, and see so now with the stack formation, I can increase the Y and the X accordingly to form a stack type formation. All right? And center rotation, see so now it does this. It rotates it on the axis of the sprite. So, as I said earlier, the default assumption is a horizontal orientation facing to the right. Now, if you want to do a vertical orientation, the easiest thing to do, I think, is just change the parent rotation to 90 degrees, right? Or any other degrees that you want. You have full 360 degrees rotation. And for horizontal orientation, it's actually handled by the top level object uh, as you normally would change the horizontal orientation with the scaling of the x-axis. So minus one would make it go to the left and one will be to the right. Now for actually instantiating bullets and firing bullets, uh, it kind of comes in two parts. There's the controller aspect which controls what triggers the firing and that's mainly up here at the top area of the controller where you have the fire command. It could be either a, a button press which comes in these two variants, button press and button press auto hold, as well as automatic and automatic auto hold. Basically, the button press is something mostly used for testing. Of course, you can have this in a final build. There's no reason not to. Uh, you can basically quickly just initiate control by uh, choosing the, the key press that you want to do the firing. And um, what auto hold does, this variant of this, is with the auto hold, together with your auto hold duration, uh, when you tap it or even hold it, it, it automatically holds the firing for that length, you know, which can be useful for a variety of, of functions. Uh, if it's set to automatic, you have to trigger it with this, with this uh, enabling this toggle, which is basically a, a public bool. So from an outside script, you can access it. Or uh, I'm not going to talk about it in this video, but you can easily automate um, behaviors, movements of these emitters using. Uh, you know, adding these automators, and it'll just, if you keep it checked, or in the case of a stepped automator, you can have it trigger the uh, trigger auto fire. But again, I'm not going to go too deep into that. Um, but anyways, that's when it's check marked, it'll just automatically fire. And of course, the other part is actually determining the projectile itself and its characteristics. So here, when we go to the point indicator for each of these emitters, we'll go to the first one here. Uh, the first thing here is a custom indicator. This actually changes this green arrow. It's sometimes, in some cases, you can create your own like cannon or, or you know, custom visual indicator. You know, because sometimes you want to actually maintain the indicator. Back here in the controller, 
Here you have the option of never showing the indicators, always showing, which is again useful if you have if you're replacing it with your own, you know, cannon or weapon or whatever it might be, or editor only, which is the default. So that's what custom indicator does. It replaces that. Then you have the shot, which is your base um, projectile behavior, right? So for bullets, if I click here and I look at my bullets, I have all these different default ones, and you can create your own. Again, that's way past you know this introductory quick start guide. Uh, you have all these different types. The probably the most common one is bullet linear non physics, and that's the one that is by default. And then you have the shot speed. The local offset is the point at which it exits either closer to the base of the arrow or past that or, or in front of the arrow um, locally. You can also adjust for each emitter its offset point here with exit point offset. I'm not going to talk really about nodes right now. I might mention a little bit about it at the end of this video. In the bullet prefab here, which I guess I'll quickly just show you what the prefab you know, is con con constituted of. It has a renderer, a collider, and its own uh, behavior script, which here it, you can either in the renderer set the bullet sprite, or you can set sprite frames here. You know, give it three frames or thirty frames, <laughs> and uh, it's actually quite efficient. You can probably get away with that, and uh, but in most cases, just a few frames to have a simple animation is quite easy with setting it there. Um, you have the rotation settings here. Uh, this is pretty common for most bullet types. Each bullet. Uh, behavior might have some differences depending on what it does. If it's a homing bullet, you'll have a different set of options here, but these are pretty common to all bullets. You have um, random start frame if you use different uh, bullet frames like I was just mentioning. Random start rotation, pretty self-explanatory. Rotation speed, also self-explanatory. Rotation speed range, this will um, change the, the range of the speed for each bullet randomly. So um, if it's 0.8, then it'll be in a range between 2.2 and 3.8. No. Um, and then, of course, direction, uh, counterclock, counterclockwise, clockwise, random, and directional relative to where the ship is facing on the x-axis. So to the right, it'll rotate clockwise. To the left, if it's facing left, it will rotate counterclockwise. So that's the gist of that. And going back to our hierarchy here with our emitter that we are looking at earlier, so parent to emitter, this is not going to be quite clear exactly why you'd want to do this right away. Um, it's usually parent, not parented to the emitter. If you always parent it to the emitter, when your ship moves, the bullet will move with the ship, or in some cases there's an invisible emitter, in which case if you move that, it can have a very dynamic effect on the bullet uh, trajectory. You can do all sorts of interesting and neat stuff. Or while shot held, again, if you're shooting with your ship and you're moving, like if it's a... Like if it's a stream of bullets and you want to sort of you know, move up and down with your ship until you know you let go of the shot or the auto hold, it will then deparent from the emitter. Shot rate, that's well, I'll <laughs> I'll just show you what shot rate, pause rate, pause length does uh, live. And of course, you have pooling available to you, which makes things a lot more efficient. Auto pool gives you a, a bunch of bullets to start off with, and you can override that if you figure you need a certain amount. Otherwise, auto pool will kind of try to calculate a conservative estimate and give you that many bullets. Usually, I don't mess with these. I think these are probably best used with something like bosses. They're, they don't get killed quickly, in which case you're auto pooling all those bullets pretty much for nothing. And so, as I was saying, the shot rate, pause rate, and length. Here we are in play mode. I'm just going to hold down the button. And there you go, that's the, the stream. It may seem a little jittery it's because I'm only recording at 30 frames per second. It's not ideal. Um, now if I go to the point here and I change the rate, actually what I'll do is instead of holding with button press, I'll just trigger it. So I have to set to automatic. And there we go. And then we'll be affecting one emitter right now. So with the rate, see that? It's actually a pretty good indicator with the other emitter is not changing. You'll show how the rate changes. You see all those, you know, sometimes they're not spaced correctly. And that's again, because of all these recording issues being in the live environment. And then pause rate, it'll pause periodically. And then the pause length determines the length of that pause. So with this, you can kind of set a bunch of rate characteristics quite easily. So when I exit play mode, we'll lose those settings. So it's good for testing in play mode, but it doesn't retain those. So I'll set those and then I'll go back here to Clone first emitter to all again, and now that will be across all the emitters. Okay. 
So I'll quickly show you how you can easily also replace these things. Uh, the color. So make it sort of magenta. Get a different sprite. Maybe, I don't know, diamond. And there's a grayscale variant, which is good for when you're color replacing. So I'll choose that. Change the shot speed. Local offset. Make this automatic. There you go. You can change the color in real time and sort of figure out what's the best color. And, you know, you can then whatever, clone this across all the emitters, or each emitter can have its own very different shot type. It's very, very flexible. Hopefully that comes across. That's my point here. All right, so that's just a really quick getting started guide. I left out a bunch of things, but I tried to make this as quick as possible because I'm just trying to get you up and running with Variabullet, you know, because I hate it when I download some some package and I have no idea what I'm where I'm even to start so that's why I did this video hopefully to just sort of get your feet wet and just get started so you know how to how to play around with variable